Coming up on 2020 on ID. Paradise on the California coast. Sand and surf. Hot sun. Hot bodies. And then... Julie, a girl with personality plus, killed in the apartment of this man's son. Sam, what happened? What did you do? But Sam, a bona fide catch with movie star looks, is nowhere to be found. Is he taunting police with bizarre clues, a possible love triangle, the victim wearing a tiara, and something else? There's a message uh, written on the back of her sweater. Inside the murder case, the twisted trail of clues, a wedding invitation, a pizza delivery. The pieces start coming together, and it is beyond diabolical. And a manhunt that turned into a boy hunt. Who's this guy? It's not Sam. Nobody knows who this guy is. I open the door, get on the ground. Everything's going on crazy. I'm freaking out. And what about Sam's neighbors, these actors? What parts do they play? Are the songbirds about to start singing on each other? I, I, don't, 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 don't. I can't be found. No, babe, I'm going to do it. Are they sticking to the script or going off it, way off? Yes, I saw the mommy. Is that what you want to hear? No, we're going to hear the truth. You will. Mystery in Apartment 410. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. It's a story that played out like the darkest of stage dramas, one that began with murder and unfolded to reveal a missing person, an unsuspecting accomplice, and finally a shocking confession that would blow the case wide open. The players, a dancer, a combat vet with movie star looks, and a wannabe actor giving the performance of his life. Before it was all over, two of the three would be dead. And as Jim Avila first reported in 2016, left behind were two families grieving their losses and searching for the truth. She is the picture of today's American girl, an immigrant's daughter, dancer, college student, and free spirit, Julie Kibuishi. She was pretty much tomboy. <laughs> She's rather play outside, and she riding was a, good a bicycle. Mm -hmm, very athletic. Julie, born in Southern California, was thriving in the golden sunshine, respecting her Japanese heritage, but thoroughly embracing what it means to be 23 along the beaches and freeways of the OC, sun-soaked Orange County, California. I would say Julie is definitely an all-American Japanese girl. She liked to sometimes bow, um, just her kindness. Kindness, that's the word you hear over and over to describe Julie, a quality no one ever expected could be her undoing. Costa Mesa 911. Is it a female or a male? It couldn't be Julie, could it? The innocent, lively, creative young woman with a big circle of friends, most of them known well by her parents. And her friends and the people she hung out with, never any danger. No. Nothing really for a mother to worry about. My kids, they didn't go anywhere that they should not to go. But mom had never met the new man in Julie's life, 26-year-old Sam Hare, older and much more experienced in the world. Julie meets him at community college. He's a handsome combat vet, even a hero with Bradley Cooper looks, who served in Afghanistan and is now home in Orange County, pursuing his college degree and a little fun along the way. Larger than life, gregarious, and by all accounts, easy to like. I hope you take me this for my mommy back home. Big, strong guy, happy-go-lucky, um, you know, just a big, Galoof. Larry Gonzalez grew up close to Sam in the military, calls him brother, and was in the trenches of Afghanistan with him at Camp Keating, a remote outpost under constant fire. It can range anywhere from half an hour to hours. And all those months on the front lines had an effect on Sam Hare. Like too many of our returning soldiers, he showed signs of PTSD. Ruben Salas is another Marine combat veteran and one of Sam's best friends. 
the sand will suffer with dreams. He'll tell me stories sometimes that, you know, he'll find himself in a foxhole and his area will be, be taken over by, you know, insurgents. Overrun. So, yes, he'll be overrun. And he'll, he'll have those nightmares. That's got to be pretty scary, huh? For him, it was very traumatic. Now, Sam Hare and Julie Kibuishi, two 20-somethings from different worlds, are living the life in Southern California. Julie, a passionate dancer, was talented enough to be accepted at the prestigious Orange County School of the Arts. It's the same school where Glee star Matthew Morrison learned his craft. Everybody wants a thrill. Cindy Pekka Dolan, the school's creative director, taught Julie for five years. Julie's kindness was really immeasurable. I mean, she just embraced everyone and life. She was very compassionate and talented as well. Very fun to watch on stage. Take a look at Julie in performance. Athletic, flexible, dynamic. Julie wasn't just artistic, she was smart. Sam was struggling. They met in anthropology class, so she volunteers to tutor him. Sam's parents, Steve and Raquel Hare, say Julie and Sam were good for each other. She looked up to him, and she was very good at tutoring him in anthropology, and he got an A in that class. And they're friends, right? And I said, Sam, is there anything going on with you and Julie? And he says, absolutely not, Dad. She's like my kid's sister. OK, what's going on, sir? But on this spring night in the OC, kid sister is in big trouble in Sam Hare's apartment. There's a what? A dead, body. a dead body? Are you sure, sir? Julie's lifeless body is sprawled across the bed. That's Sam's dad, Steve, making the breathless 911 call. Sam was supposed to come to our house for the weekend. When Saturday came, we hadn't heard from Sam, and throughout the day, I was calling his phone. But his phone would just, it was off, and Sam never turned his phone off. And I said, uh, honey, I'm going to drive on down to Sam's to make sure everything is OK. And I had the key to his apartment. I walked in, and everything was neat. Everything was clean. I looked around. I called Sam. Nobody in this case. It's your son's apartment? Yes, yes. He's in the bedroom. He's like, there's victim sexual activity. She's dead. There's blood on her head. I, I knew she was dead. But I could see, unfortunately, I hate to say it, the clothes were ripped off. Does your son know who it is? He's not here. Jesus. You walk into his apartment. Correct. And there's a dead woman there. Correct. What's going through your mind? The initial thought is, Sam, what happened? What, what, what did you do? But Sam, who outwitted and survived the Taliban in Afghanistan, was not around to answer. He was suddenly, unexpectedly, off the grid. The motive for the murder is still not known. Samuel Hearn hasn't been seen. Police have issued an all-points bulletin for Sam Hare, a combat veteran suffering from flashback nightmares. Well, PTSD is very, uh, very much in the back of our minds. So you knew he knew how to use a weapon? Correct. That's why the Armed and Dangerous uh, comes in where he's missing and there's a possibility that he has weapons with him. So everything that you heard about him pointed to Sam as being the guy. There's absolutely no way that it was not Sam. Back at the crime scene, Julie's cell phone is constantly beeping with text messages. Her Taylor Swift ringtone alerting the cops to its presence. Her mother, June, is searching for the good daughter who never is out of touch. I don't even know how many times I text her. And are you still asleep or are you, you know, are you okay? And no respond. And then I started to think, what's going on? When we come back, what the killer writes on her back that points to a love triangle. Was Julie caught between two lovers? Obviously, there's a dead woman in my son's apartment, and he's missing. I get it. Uh, you know, the, all the uh, suspicions are going to be on him. Stay with us. First, we're going to start off with a very shocking story. It's out of California. Julie Kibuishi is murdered, a gunshot to the head, found in her friend's bachelor pad apartment. There's no sign of struggle here, no sign of Sam. By his bed, an unused knife, a couple of books, a combat how-to, and the other on the wonders of sex. Out back, a barbecue on the patio. 
Everything neat and in its place. And on the counter, a wedding invitation for Sam's downstairs neighbors, his good friends, actors Dan Wozniak and Rachel Buffett. Now, Costa Mesa police have released a photo and vehicle description hoping to locate a 26-year-old man suspected of killing. Costa Mesa, in the heart of Orange County, a city of 100,000. It averages just two murders a year. But on this May night, with a half moon rising, Lieutenant Ed Everett and Detective Jose Morales walk into what looks like a slam dunk of a murder case. I was thinking a potential love triangle. Right as you walk into that uh, doorway, you can see Julie's body positioned on the bed. And what was the condition of her body? Uh, she had one gunshot wound, uh, kind of top center of the head. Um, she was wearing a tiara. A tiara. When Julie is murdered, she's wearing a crown. Her last night began as one of the happiest in her life. She had a dinner date with her big brother, Taka, to help plan his wedding. Her mother, June, remembers her practically bouncing out the door. His fiance asked her to become a bridesmaid. She gave her the tiara. That was pretty special for her, too, right? Yeah. She didn't take it off. It was getting late, close to midnight, but Sam is desperately texting her. Messages that were still on her phone when police found it in her purse in Sam's apartment. The text messages were very important. Sam texts he is out helping his downstairs neighbor Dan Wozniak, the actor buddy, short on funds, getting married and freaking out over how he'll pay for his wedding, helping Dan, then headed to folks for weekend. But less than two hours later, Sam seems suddenly in distress, texting Julie, can you come over tonight at midnight alone? Very upset, need to talk. Then, Jesus, I really just want to talk. I need someone I trust. Julie responds, I'm here for you like family. And those were not the only messages on the night she was murdered. Police discover another more vile text. This one, handwritten by the killer on Julie's body. There was a message uh, written on the back of her sweater. And as cleaned up as you can, what was the message? It was, F you, all yours. The working police theory? We looked at the phone and thought, OK, maybe he's drinking, using drugs, and there was an incident. And he just snapped and you know, sexually assaulted her and, and you know, wound up killing her and then fled. Now, they just have to find Sam. Police say the 26-year-old has disappeared. Neighbors say his bicycle sits outside his apartment, but his vehicle is gone. His passport was missing. His car was missing. Orange County Senior Deputy District Attorney Matt Murphy is supervising the case from the first call and says there is little mystery here. I'm looking at everything going, come on, guys, this is obvious. You know, you're going to find Sam. He's going to be our killer. The final clue for police and Murphy, a big red flag. Sam Hare, the war hero's background check. He's been in big trouble before. He was arrested for murder. He was tried for murder. A murder charge points to Sam. Squarely, absolutely. It points it's with, a, with a neon sign. Turns out Sam had been accused as a young man of luring a friend to a parking lot where he was killed by gang members. The charges didn't stick. He was acquitted. But if you're a cop investigating a murder... We thought, OK, if, if he has this, he's predisposed, and, and maybe he did it again. Then, two days after Julie's body is found, police get a big break in a new direction with the help of Sam's father. Steve, you know, he was a bulldog throughout this investigation, and, and initially he and Raquel had indicated that they thought that their son Sam was kidnapped and was a victim, which we thought at the time was just kind of outlandish. So it didn't make sense at the time? No, it didn't make sense. But Steve Hare, convinced his son could not be a murderer, is conducting his own parallel investigation, not looking for a killer, just looking for his son. And when the banks open Monday, he hits pay dirt, discovering a digital trail. 1159-1205. This is your investigative box. This is pretty much the investigative box. Steve shares a bank account with Sam, where his son saved $62,000 in combat pay. He's first to notice his son may have disappeared, but his debit card is not too far away. I went on the computer, and I saw there was activity. So I assumed if Sam were somebody was using it in uh, Long Beach. That's just 20 miles away, and when he gets to the bank, hanging around fruitlessly at the ATM for hours, Steve sees a bank alert. His son's card is being repeatedly used at another Long Beach location, Echo's Pizza. 
So I went there, I went to the uh, pizza place, checked around looking for Sam's car. Sat there for an hour. No luck, but the cops now have the same information and they have the edge on Steve because they have access to those little cameras above the ATM machines. The bank sent us these videos. It was a day or two later, and then we were surprised to go, okay, who's this kid? It's not Sam. His parents don't know who it is. Nobody knows who this guy is. A pizza-loving, baseball cap-wearing stranger is draining Sam's bank account. An accomplice? A kidnapper? A killer? Stay with us. With the murder of Julie Kibuishi, investigators are determined to talk to the last person believed to have seen her alive, Sam Hare. The problem is, he's nowhere to be found. There has been a break in the case. One police hope will lead them to Hare. But as Jim Avila picks up the story, that lead is about to take this case in a most unexpected direction. The digital trail is suddenly white hot. The suspect in Julie's murder, Sam Hare, may be in police sights. Sam's debit card is showing up in Long Beach, four ATM withdrawals and two pizza deliveries. But at the end of the trail, a mystery man, or more accurately, a mystery boy. We were surprised to go, okay, who's this kid? Great question. And to answer it, you've heard of follow the money. How about follow the pepperoni? The cops are hungry to crack this case, and they know from the bank records their suspect is just hungry. A pizza has been delivered to a certain address in, in the city of Long Beach. A police copter overhead, undercover cops watching the pizza house. Police think, finally, they may have found Sam Hare's hideout. When I hear this helicopter circling, I'm like, what's going on? Recognize him? You've already seen this kid. His name, Wesley Freilich. The baseball cap teen in those pictures taken at the ATM. The 16-year-old skateboarder now at the center of a full-on SWAT team helicopter hovering raid looking for a murderer at his mom's house where he and a few friends, are you guessed it, half into a large pepperoni pie. I open the door and that's when they say, don't move, sir, come here immediately. Get on the ground. Wesley was trying to be a tough guy in front of his friends. Uh, as we explained the gravity of the situation, that a, a murder was involved in this case. He had a change of demeanor, started crying. I'm myself. Everything's going on crazy. I'm freaking out. I'm being questioned about this whole withdrawing money from the ATM. Police quickly figure Wes is not the murderer. But where is Sam? Um, the police go inside. My mom's door to her bedroom is shut and locked and the police are assuming that he's in there. So we forced entry into to that room to, to search it. Sam is not there, but his missing ATM card is. Time for young Wesley to answer a few questions. And I immediately told them everything. I, I said, this is what happened. Turns out the ATM runs for Sam's cash were not Wes's idea. He had a trusted friend, an older guy, his mom, Lori, met in community theater. Oh, he's a cool, he's a cool kind of cat that I would like to groove with. That cool cat is none other than Dan Wozniak. Remember him? He's Sam's broke downstairs neighbor. They hang out together at the apartment jacuzzi, and now Dan is about to be married. He's currently starring in a local production of the musical Nine. See what I mean? West tells the authorities Dan gave him Sam's ATM card and PIN number and fed him a story about using that card to collect money Sam Hare owed him, a scheme only a 16-year-old with a hankering for free pizza might believe. He said um, that he worked for a bail bondsman agency directly through a private sector company that helps with the uh, collections of money that are from escaped uh, convicts or people that are on the run. And he said that Sam was somebody who owed the bail bondsman money. Yeah, he had a actual folder of paperwork and saying that this was all legal, that it's all good to go, uh, and all they need to do is withdraw the money and to uh, make sure I wore a hat and glasses. So Wes and Dan drive from mom's house around the corner and down the block to the Chase ATM. Where is he parked? He's parked over there in that parking lot. So he can see what you're doing? Yes. Well, the cameras aren't seeing him, but the cameras are seeing me. He rolls over to the ATM on his skateboard, but at the machine, young Wes 
has a little trouble. I skate across and come here. I put the card in, gave me the pin. Back at the car, Wes says Dan is jumpy. The first reaction actually was, why did I take so long? Um, and I told him my first time using an ATM, so I don't know what I'm exactly what I'm doing. He knew enough to withdraw $400 in over the next few days, similar amounts that he turned over to Dan Wozniak, who had rapidly become a suspect in the disappearance of Sam Hare, and a person of interest who may know how Julie Kibuishi died. So at that point, it's time to bring Dan in. Yes, it is. I had Detective Morales call uh, Daniel uh, using a ruse of, hey, we need you to come down. And Dan said uh, he wouldn't, wasn't available. He was at his bachelor party. The Hares and the Kibuishis are waiting for answers. But Dan is busy, and he blows off the cops. These families, they're experiencing the worst grief that a family could experience. At that moment, Daniel Wozniak's on his way to his bachelor party. He won't come to them, so they go to him. Dan Wozniak was there with a couple of his friends. And immediately when he saw me, you could see the, the, the blood drain from his face. He turned pale and immediately looked down. He says, I'm going to tell you everything. I'm sick of covering for Sam. I'm sick of covering for him. I'm going to tell you everything. Are Sam and Dan in cahoots? Where is Sam? One thing we know, there will be no celebration on this night for Dan Wozniak. He's under arrest and headed to the interrogation room. And so are we. How was your life in danger? He threatened it. And all of a sudden, um, the pieces start coming together, and it is beyond diabolical. You just told us you saw two bullet wounds. You were standing no, 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 no. Stay with us. The investigation into the murder of Julie Kibuishi has taken an unexpected turn. Sam Hare, originally the prime suspect in Julie's death, is now believed to be missing himself. And police think they know who may be behind his disappearance, his downstairs neighbor and friend, Dan Wozniak. Now Wozniak is under arrest and about to tell his side of the story. And as Jim Avila reports, this case will be rocked by what he has to say. A murder case with a Shakespearean twist. I am lusting for more. Dan Wozniak, the affable baritone accustomed to the warmth of the spotlight, suddenly finds himself in the cold glare of a police grill. But the OC community theater crowd just loved it. And here you are acting together, huh? You and yeah, Dan? this is our... Wes's scene. mom, Lori Freilich, often performed with Dan Wozniak. He was just such a fun guy. He was fun. He was a good actor. He was also someone that Lori, a single mom, trusted to spend time with her son. I would call him up and say, um, Wesley really could use a ride from school. I'm staying late at work. Could you get him? He would go. He'd pick him up. They'd go for pizza. You know, he was kind. He was thoughtful. Carol and Anthony Celeste were also part of the theater crowd. Anthony recalls an easygoing guy, the type he says you'd like to have a beer with. He was very outgoing, very likable, had that twinkle in his eye. I always tell people that he was the type of person that, you know, you saw them and they were such a life of the party that you, it made you look back and think, man, I wish I had that kind of personality. <laughs> But the personable Dan was apparently draining his buddy Sam's bank account to pay for his wedding. Did he have money problems? Always had money problems. You know, constantly going from one job to another. It was a definite roller coaster. Hi, my name's Dan Wozniak. I'll be playing the role of John Davis. Now, Davison. money is a really big yeah. dilemma for Dan. He's about to marry Rachel Buffett. And you will be my true love. Here she is as his co-star in that musical Nine. Dan had no full-time job, and now he's in full-blown crisis, needing to finance his wedding and honeymoon and putting the squeeze on some of his friends. My wife calls me. She tells me real quickly, hey, Dan's been calling. Um, he wants to borrow money. I said, what is it for? And he's, she's like, look, it's something to do with his wedding. He, he needs to talk to you. But those wedding plans may have to be put on hold as police pick Dan up from his bachelor party and take him to this interrogation room. Daniel was sitting here in this chair. It is to be a long night of questioning about how he came to possess and then manipulate a naive teenager to use Sam Hare's ATM card. And while we're at it, where is Sam? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. 
Lieutenant Everett has a prime seat in front of the monitors in the detective room. Yeah, my role was to watch the interview and see if there's something that they may not be picking up on. What he sees is a performance worthy of Nathan Lane. Oh, my God. Dramatic. <laughs> Sometimes even over the top. I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know what else you want me to say. But first, a little staged mea culpa. He admits he talked young Wes into being the stooge at the ATM. He asked if it was illegal. I said, no, 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 don't worry. That was a lie. It's here. The interrogators aren't doing much interrogating at this point. They're just sitting back and watching the performance as the actor, working without a script, desperately looks for an ending. He tells the cops on the night of Julie's murder his play went well. And afterwards, he and his fiance Rachel celebrated. I took a shower, we had sex. But the morning after Julie is killed, the plot thickens. According to Dan's story to police, there's a knock at his door. Open the door, it was safe. I'm like, hey man, what's going on? Everything good? He's like, not good. I did something bad. What did you do? It's like, there's a dead body in my apartment. I shot somebody. It was a fit of rage. That's Dan's first story. He knows about Julie's murder, helped Sam escape, but had no hands-on role. The cops are not buying it. Tell us the truth. You're not that good of an actor. This is your chance to clear the air. Zing. The screws, as cops were called in the old black and white movies, are done just listening. Now they're tightening. I guess what, for not to eliminate you? It's uh, it's in your best interest. Yes, most definitely, uh, sir. So basically, just open your mouth for me. Thinking fast, Dan invents an excuse that would cover his DNA being at the murder scene. Now, I was in Sam's apartment Friday afternoon. Okay. Then, this actor without a script moves to act two, a second version of that night. But he loses his cool and makes a critical mistake. The cops hear it. See if you do. Yes, I saw the body. Is that what you want to hear? No. We want to hear the truth. That is the truth. Okay. How'd your DNA get on her? Because that was right. The body. DNA doesn't just fall off. I don't know. Okay. I didn't touch her. I didn't do anything. What did you see? I saw two gunshots in her head. Why did the two bullet holes bother you so much that he knew that there were two bullet holes? Because when we were in the apartment and we all looked in, it was only one visible to, to our eyes. And then when he had mentioned he saw two gunshot wounds, I said, well, he was there when she was shot. He must have seen or done the actual two shots. Right. He was there when she was killed. Cue the gotcha music. Dan Wozniak has a lot of explaining to do now. You just told us you saw two bullet wounds. You were standing no, 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 okay. Whoa, 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 okay. stop. You can't even keep your lies straight. His story kept changing. Um, I think he thought that his acting ability was going to carry him through this, this performance, so to speak, and it wasn't doing it. Detectives send Wozniak back to his cell. With the gravity of the situation sinking in, he asked to call his fiance, Rachel. Hello? Hi, baby. It's a call that will finally bring down the curtain on Dan's one-man show. I need to make a phone call to the detective now. Why? Why? Because Rachel has found out that Dan's brother, Tim, is carrying incriminating evidence. He had the murder weapon, and at some point, Tim says, hey, I've got to, I've got to get rid of this. Uh, Daniel's been arrested. Rachel tells Dan she's going to the cops. I need to call him and let him know before they catch me on this recording device because it looks like I'm not trying to tell him right away. Then I'm doomed. Do you know that Tim has some evidence? Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Okay. Well, this is, this is ridiculous, and I have to go tell the detective no, the truth. No, baby, baby, um, Tim, Tim did speak up? Only to me so far, and it was in passing. I said, I'm going to the police station right now. Danny's been arrested. He's, he starts freaking out. No, I, don't, I was, don't, 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 don't. That can't be found. No, babe, I'm going to do it. Listen to me, listen to me. No. no. What? Trust me, please. You realize they're recording this phone conversation anyways. You're being an absolute ass to try and lie again. And that's when he decides to, to let the jailer know, hey, I need to speak to the detectives. Up next, 
the final act. Do you want to talk to us, yes or no? Yes. Okay. The chilling truth about Sam Hare, the war hero, from the voice of the man who knows where he is. It's borderline fun. Is that what you want to hear? Stay with us. Sunset at Eisenhower Beach along Southern California's Riviera Coast. Doesn't get much better than this. It's where community theater actors Dan Wozniak and Rachel Buffett plan to marry and then honeymoon aboard a cruise ship right after their musical Nine closes in a couple of days. But there's been a hiccup in their matrimonial machinations. I would as news reporter Eileen Frere is live in Long Beach with new information on this grisly case. Dan may not make those nuptials. He has a previous but sudden and more pressing engagement with police. He's performing the final act. After 14 hours at the police station, he's about to admit that he killed not just one innocent, but two in a macabre plot worthy of Pulp Fiction. You said you wanted to talk to me. What's going on? I'm crazy and I did it. You did what? I killed Julia and I killed Sam. Okay. All right. Where's the boat? Dan Wozniak labels himself a pathological liar in a downward spiral for two years who couldn't bear to admit to his beautiful fiance he had no job, no money, was about to be evicted and could not afford to marry her. But Sam, his neighbor, had saved all his combat pay and had an account that looked like problem solved for Dan. $62,000 is unlimited wealth in the world of Daniel Wozniak. He's the perfect target. He was kind of a grifter, right? I mean, he, he was a guy looking f for the edge all the time. Right. He's one. Of, everybody knows somebody like that. He's always got the get-rich-quick scheme. He's always, you know, he's, he's always got a plan. And his plan included his war hero friend Sam, who out of kindness volunteered to help him with his wedding. Sam was actually the first to die. Dan Wozniak had the cold heart of a debt collector. So Daniel Wozniak's world, there was no problem in his mind murdering two people so he can go on a honeymoon. The scene of the crime, another local theater, less than 20 miles away, backstage, beyond the lights, up in the dark, dank rafters, he lures Sam to an unexpected, violent death. I went upstairs and then said, well, we need to move something from the attic. And? and when he bent down, I grabbed the gun and I shot him. How many times? I once said that he was still alive. Where'd you shoot him at? The back of the head as he was leaning down. Uh -huh. And then the second time? The second time he was down, he was still talking and saying, I need help. What are you saying? I need help. The sun hit me and sun. It felt like an electric shock. Uh -huh. And then what'd you do? I reloaded my fire and killed And it's not over by far. Wozniak tells the interrogators, If you go up the ladder from the theater, his head and hands have been decapitated. Lieutenant Everett, watching his monitors in the detective room, is about to fall over. And I turned to somebody and said, did I just hear what I think I heard? Okay, are the body parts there? No. Where are they? The nature center in the middle park. Um, what was going on in your mind? I was actually smiling and laughing. He's laughing and smiling as he cuts off the head of this fine young man who bravely served his country so that he can go on a honeymoon? You know, it's beyond horrific. It's evil. Absolutely, it's evil. But despite all the terrible things these grizzled detectives have heard, there is something that bothers them even more. The senseless murder of an innocent near stranger, Julie Kibuishi. Julie is basically being killed to cover this thing up, and it, it just, I mean, it's, it's horrific. And here's what you didn't know till now. After killing him, Dan Wozniak takes Sam's phone and sends Julie those urgent texts to lure her to her death. Julie was wearing like a crown tiara. She had just come from her brother's. So I'm keen, let's go in. Yeah. And then said, oh, by the way, did you see this in Sam's bed? And she was laid over and put two bullets in the back of her head. Why did you feel you had to, to kill uh, Julie? What was the rationale behind that? Seriously, to cover up Sam. And so I well, why? how would that cover up Sam? To make it look like he was on the run and he did. His plan is to make Sam Hare look like not only just a killer, but a rapist and a crook. His plan is to destroy his memory 
and destroy his, his reputation. The search continues here in a heavily wooded area of this park. We had search teams broken up into different quadrants. Someone out this way, someone back here, someone in this part of the park. I transported them to present the backpack. I got plastic bags from his cafe, put them in the backpack. Was he able to get, just walk in here with a backpack full of body parts? He came in with just plastic trash bags and then uh, kind of dug shallow holes and covered them with uh, leaves and, and the debris that you see around. And what did Dan do after killing two people? This is that night's rap party for the cast and crew of Nine. Center stage, a smiling Wozniak. By the way, Sam would have been 27 on the day he was found in the park. Clearly, there was no party for the hares on that terrible day. Okay, it's his birthday. And I remember waking up and thinking, I'm hoping, I'm praying, they find my son's head. <laughs> Who can write a script on that? Sam's body is so unrecognizable, it had to be identified by love. A tattoo on his chest in honor of his parents. It was a heart and a rose and just said mom and dad right. in there. So it signified that I love you. Right on his chest. Right big, very big, and he's yeah. like this size. Yeah. After the confession, police recover the backpack filled with evidence. Sam's bloody clothes, his passport, and wallet, and the gun that killed him. Even with all that, he pleaded not guilty. Wozniak's trial, which ended in January of 2016, was quick and to the point. With the prosecution, a few witnesses, a summation, and of course, Dan's confession. It was all just about the money. That was it. At this five-day trial, the defense had no opening argument. They called no witnesses, and in their closing, did not come close to using the word innocent, or even asked for a not guilty verdict. And they never tried to claim that Dan was legally insane. In real life, day to day, you, me, we look at somebody like that, anybody who would murder another human being for money has to have a screw loose. But the definition of legal insanity, they need to be, um, so insane and so crazy that they don't understand the nature and quality of their actions. They don't know right and wrong. They don't know right and wrong. There's nothing wrong with Daniel Wozniak's head. It's, it's his heart that is screwed up. The jury wasted little time. We, the jury, find the defendant, Daniel Patrick Wozniak, guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree. This trial was not about whether or not he was guilty. He was guilty. Guilty of two counts of first degree murder, but no one is leaving the courtroom because next, this same jury must decide the bigger question. Does Dan Wozniak deserve to die for his crimes? And on that question, the jury reveals it has some doubts. And you didn't want to be deadlocked. No. Well, no. it was just an agonizing decision. This entire proceedings was going to be what's going to happen, what's the penalty? Prosecutor Matt Murphy challenges the jury to honor Sam Hare and Julie Kibuishi and punish the man who not only killed them, but desecrated them. Danny Wozniak treated him like trash. He treated Julie like trash. So the question that I ask you to answer in your verdicts, are they? Daniel Wozniak's defense is that he is not the worst of the worst, that he is helping fellow prisoners now and deserves to live, to reform. Defense attorney Scott Sanders. He has it in him, and he's going to make a difference. Is that a mitigating factor to you that warrants life? I hope so. Back in the jury room, the vote for death is split. It's very different yes. when you are the one sitting there almost literally pulling the trigger. The initial vote, 10-2, death. But when the jury's thoughts turn to the surviving families, the doubt melts away. Steve Hare. The, the rage, the anger that, that he had on that stand during the penalty phase. That was just uh, overwhelming. When, when he, they showed the photograph of the funeral for Sam. His life was real to you. Absolutely. Mrs. Kibuishi, you know, when she's talking about her daughter being a dancer, and I'm thinking about my daughters. The next thing I remember, I'm sitting in my car and I'm sobbing over that testimony. If there is a time for a death penalty, this was this probably was it. it. Daniel Wozniak had the entire time from driving with Sam to the theater to think about what he was going to do, come back, think that night. He started texting Julie. He had that whole night to rethink. I mean, he had so many opportunities along back the up. entire process. It was not only beyond reasonable doubt, it was beyond any doubt at all. 
The final vote came quickly. In just over an hour, one of the shortest death penalty deliberations on record. The family says justice was served 12-0. We, the jury, determined that the penalty to be imposed upon defendant Daniel Patrick Wozniak to be death. I just have voted to put a man to death. And this is a really sobering moment and one I'm going to live with the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And down in my gut, I said, can I live with this? And I said, yes. And afterwards, there is more relief than joy. It was so, 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 so long overdue. But I could start healing. It's time. You know, we feel like one closure to our nightmare chapter. To this day, June Kibuichi says her daughter's death makes her question the fundamentals of parenting, her soul now doubting that kindness always triumphs over evil. I told all my kids, be, be nice person, kind to other people, and if they need help, you should help. But that just took my daughter's life. And that just killed me, you know, just. For Sam Hare, he escaped death in one of the most dangerous places in the world to be killed in one of the safest, leaving parents he called his best friends and who today can find peace in only one spot. And you still go to the grave? Every week, we go there, we bring chairs. I bring the newspaper, and then often I'll take a 10 or 15 minute nap. Mm -hmm. Very peaceful. It makes me feel good. The only time we talk is when I say bye, see you next week. We love you. Yeah. As of 2017, Daniel Wozniak is appealing his death sentence. Meanwhile, authorities later charged both his ex fiancee, Rachel Buffett, and his brother, Timothy Wozniak, with being accessories after the fact. Both have pled not guilty. Sam Hare's parents attend court hearings and follow developments in the ongoing cases and continue to visit Sam's grave. As for the family of Julie Kibuishi, her mother June tells us they are moving on with their lives, even though Julie is constantly missed.